So we are continuing with our Mythbusters series of the storm kind of... Uh, Levi, let's go ahead and turn this one on here. Uh, I'm going to be moving around a little bit with the... with Yeah, there we go. Perfect. All right. So... Uh, this is our, our this will probably be our final Mythbusters series, and we're going to go into what we talked about uh, last week a little bit on the false friends argument that's being made right now against the King James, and these old archaic words don't really mean what they, you think they mean. So this is a perfect one to end, I believe, the Mythbuster series to segue into that new series where we're going to study is our King James Bible really archaic? Is it really outdated? Are we really reading it and just really not knowing what the true meaning is because we are so ignorant of words? That's what they want you to believe. We'll study and see if that's true or not. But today we're going to be studying the claim, did Peter Ruckman and the SDA, does anybody know what the SDA stands for? Seventh-day Adventist. Did Peter Ruckman and the SDA, Seventh-day Adventist, invent... King James onlyism. So the claim is, is that they, that they did. How many ever heard that Peter Ruckman invented KJV onlyism? Well, Peter Ruckman came along. Yeah, that's a common one. How many ever heard the Seventh Day Adventist invented King James onlyism? That, that's not a, as common one. It was several years ago. I've heard it a lot. Okay, and a lot of people will hear that claim. They'll study it. There's some books out there. We'll, we'll read some of the claims about it. Okay, so that's the claim. King James onlyism is a recent invention. We could also say that King James onlyism was a recent invention in the last 100 years. Nobody held this position until a few fringe nutcases invented it. Okay, so let's go ahead and go to the next slide here, Dan. Dr. James D. Price, he made this statement. He said the King James only view uh, originated, some of this is cut off, originated in the latter decades of the 20th century. So that's just the 1900s, right? The 20th century, 1900s. He said, I witnessed its birth. It was conceived through the work of a Seventh-day Adventist, Benjamin G. Wilkinson, 1930. All right, remember that name because we'll be looking at it here in a minute. And through the works of Jasper James Ray, 1955, and Edward F. Hills, 1956. Watch this, but these seeds... Notice his claim here, remained relatively dormant. So these seeds, these three people he mentioned, the, these seeds of KJV onlyism remained relatively dormant. Nobody cared about them. Nobody paid attention to them. Until cultivated by the works of Peter S. Ruckman, 1970, that's when he wrote Manuscript Evidence, and David Otis Fuller, and I believe if I'm getting it right, and the internet will, will I'm sure correct me if I'm wrong, uh, God only wrote one Bible. I believe that was Fuller, Okay. And that was in 1970 as well. So that's the claim. All right, let's go to the next slide, Dan. Uh, only, uh, one Bible only. This is examining the exclusive claims for the King James Bible, a book written by Roy Beecham and Kevin Balder. And this was uh, done in 2001. The claim here in this book is the beginning of the modern movement that asserts, that, uh, asserts the essential inspiration and inerrancy of the King James Version of the Bible in English can certainly be traced to the publication of a book in 1930. All right, do you remember? This sounds so familiar. What does this sound exactly like? A hundred years prior, 1830. Uh, dispensationalism and the pre-trib rapture can be traced to one man, John Nelson Darby in 1830. And then a hundred years later, they're saying this, this, this one book can be solely traced to that of one man. Okay. Folks, can I say this? It is a very, very dangerous thing to begin to claim that a movement only started. Okay, I'm, I'm, can I give you a personal one? Can I give you a personal one? I used to say that the modern day tongues movement and that all this charismatic stuff started when? And I think I've even said it here. The Azusa Street Revival, 1901. It's just simply not true. There have been pockets of charismatic movements all over the world. Doesn't mean they're right, but they started before 1901. So that was a personal thing that I, I read a book written by a Pentecostal trying to defend the charismatic gift. Of course, I don't agree with what he's saying, but he had documentation after documentation after documentation of these events happening throughout church history where these little charismatic revivals would break out with all these quote-unquote sign gifts. That's not a recent invention of 1901. That's simply what popularized it. 
Does that make sense? So that was a personal, a personal study of mine that I had to like, wow, I, I've, been, I've been saying that wrong. Okay? So always be careful about saying that a movement or a certain particular thing, that's where it started. Because guys, until you have read everything that there is to read, uh, you never know what somebody believed. What. I, I have had stuff that I'm like, man, I don't know anybody else that believes this. God has specifically showed me a truth out of the Bible that I've never heard anybody else say. And then I'll read some 18th century writer and they said it 300 years before I was even a thought. So be careful with that kind of stuff. So notice, this guy says, these two men say that it can all be traced to the publication of a book in 1930. Let's go to the next slide. So who is this Seventh-day Adventist? Who was this fella in 1930 that wrote a book? All right, his name was Benjamin G. Wilkinson. Benjamin G. Wilkinson, go to the next slide there. He was a staunch Seventh-day Adventist, okay, a staunch one. Uh, he was also the dean of theology at the Washington Adventist College right outside of Washington, D.C., okay? Back then, I think it was called the Washington Seminary College, okay? Wilkinson was part of the conservative faction of the SDA who believed in the inerrancy of not only the scriptures, which we thank God for, but unfortunately, because he was a staunch SDA, he also believed in the writings and the inerrancy and the inspiration of the writings of Ellen G. White, who is considered the main prophetess in the Seventh-day Adventist church. So he was a staunch adhere to the inerrancy of Scripture and the inspiration of Scripture, uh, and unfortunately also of Ellen G. White, okay? He was an outspoken critic of Westcott and Hort. Y'all remember us studying those two fine, dandy, wonderful Christian gentlemen? I say that facetiously. He was an outspoken critic of Westcott and Hort, and rejected the critical text in favor of the Texas Receptus. He was a fighter along with uh, Dean Burgon and all that kind of stuff. As far as the belief system, he fell into that line of defending the Texas Receptus and, 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 and favoring the King James, okay? Although, now here's the, here's the thing about it. Although he is a doctrinal nightmare, okay, this does not make his views on the translation issue incorrect. And that's one thing that people really like, well, man, this is all started by a Seventh-day Adventist. Number one, we're, we're, we're going to study that and see that it's not true. It did not originate with a Seventh-day Adventist. Number two, um, just because a Seventh-day Adventist said it does not make it incorrect, okay? The Catholics believe in the virgin birth. The Catholics believe in the bodily resurrection. The Catholics believe in the Trinity. So these statements by, and we're not going to really study any statements by Wilkinson himself, I'd love to get that book. I'd love to read it. Um, but we're not really uh, studying any statements by him. But the fact that he wrote a book in 1930 in favor of the King James only movement does, and, well, but he was a Southern, or he was a, a, S, a SDA. That doesn't make it incorrect, right? A dead clock is right how many times a day? Twice, right? All right, so let's go to the next one. In 1930, Benjamin Wilkinson wrote a book entitled our authorized Bible vindicated. Okay, let's go to the next one. But did, here's the question though. But did these KJV only arguments and sentiments, did this all originate with him? Now, according to Roy Beecham, and I forget the other guy's name, Broader or Bought or whatever it is, according to them, it did. According to James Price, it did. According to a bunch of internet uh, experts, you know, all these people that love to comment on the internet and Facebook and all these random places. According to them, it all started. And by the way, a lot of these guys are the same people that are saying that dispensationalism and the preacher of rapture started with Darby. And we've seen that that was completely untrue. Okay? Remember, he wrote, <laughs> he wrote this book in 1930. Dr. Ruttman was born in 1921 and did not write manuscript evidence until 1970. So here is Dr. Ruttman spreading his heresies at the ripe old age of nine. Somehow Dr. Ruttman influenced Benjamin Wilkinson into the King James Only movement at nine years old. It's amazing, all right? Well, let's look at a few claims now. These are all going to be claims that were made prior to Dr. Ruckman being converted. These also are going to be claims that were made prior to, some of them being made prior to Benjamin Wilkinson writing his book. Some of these claims are going to be after Wilkinson wrote the book, but are going to be referring back to a hundred years prior to the time it was written. So, so, uh, so before Wilkinson would have even been born, okay? 
So let's look at a few of these. William Lyon Phelps, okay? He wrote, he was a professor at Yale. He was an, a, a genius of a man. This is what he said. He said, that, by the way, these two quotes are from 1919 and 1922, okay? 1919, two years before Dr. Ruttman was born, 11 years before uh, Wilkinson wrote the book. 1922, Ruttman was a year old, spreading his heresy then, evidently. And then that was also eight years before Wilkinson wrote the book. You ready for the quote? Now remember, we are claiming, our claim is that the King James Bible, the English Bible of 1611, is the inerrant, infallible, inspired words of God. Isn't that what we believe? And what they would have, what the critics would have you think is that's a new idea that originated no earlier than 1930 and that that's a radical fringe view that nobody before this century ever held on to. That's what they would have you believe. Well, let's look what he said. He said, we Anglo-Saxons have a better Bible than the French or the Germans or the Italians or the Spanish. Our English translation is even better than the original Hebrew or Greek. Wow. If I were to, you know what's funny? If I, were to, if I were to get a piece of paper like a clipboard and I were to go around and just interview all these random preachers and all these random Bible scholars, and if I were just to read that, read that statement and say, now was that said by a, was that said by a pastor? Was that said by a Yale professor? Was that said by a secular uh, secular uh, university, whatever? Or was that said by Peter Ruckman? They all said, oh, I was said by Peter Ruckman. <laughs> no, it was said by a 19, uh, early 1900s Har- or excuse me, Yale professor. That's what he said. He also said there is only one way to explain this. The authorized version was inspired. Let's go to the next quote by him. This one's from, uh, I can't remember, I think that one we just read was by in 1919. I think this is 1922. He said there is no English in the world equal to that found in the 1611 Bible. The revisers knew more Greek and less English. Whether the original text was inspired or not, I have never felt any doubt as to the divine inspiration of the version of 1611. Notice, he said, I'm not really sure if the originals were inspired or not. He said, but I have no doubt the English was. I mean, we don't, I mean, we don't even believe that, right? I mean, that's, that's heresy. But that's what he said. He was so sure of the English text, all right? He was born January 2nd, 1865, and he died August 21st, 1943. In case you haven't figured out the timeline yet, that was both of those statements said before Wilkinson wrote the book, before Ruckman was even converted, one of them before Ruckman was even born. Just trying to give you the timeline. Well, I thought it could be originated in 1930. Well, eh, here we go. All right. He died, oh, yeah, there. He died six years before Ruckman was even saved. Ruckman was converted. Uh, March 19th, I think, is what I was reading last night. March 19th of 1944. Okay, so there you go. Here's an interesting character. Uh, I mean, this, is, this guy looks creepy enough, right? Uh, Jake, this is the guy that me and Dan were trying to say you looked like last night, making fun of you, yeah. Uh, so uh, this guy's Manly P. Hall is his name. He was uh, a minister, uh, I, I don't want to say Christian minister, even though you know, some people would say he was a you know, pastor or whatever. But this guy was an, an occultist. Uh, you could go and do an entire biographical study on this guy. This guy was as lost as the day is long. He posed himself as a, uh, Brother Darren, do you remember, if I remember correctly, United Church of Christ or something like that? Do you remember what denomination he was? Yeah, he was a yeah, he was a major Freemason. He was a uh, a big time a big time occultist. He was obsessed with the occult. Um, he was a philosopher. I mean, this guy was was an absolute apostate. I don't think the man was saved by any stretch of the imagination. You could not get any further from a Christian than this dude right here. Okay, notice what he said. <clears throat> this is in 1944. This is what he what he said. Manly P. Hall for the last. 100 years, hold on, back up, 1944, you back up 100 years, that's what, 1844. What, interestingly enough, happened in the 1840s? There was a new translation. No, no, Westcott and Hort, the Greek texts were correlated, but remember 1844 specifically, when I say it, y'all are going to be like, oh yeah. 
That's when they discovered Sinaiticus. That's when they discovered Sinaiticus, the Greek text that correlated that. So remember, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus, they correlated the Greek texts. 1881, West Scott and Hort came out with their Greek text from the Sinaiticus and the, and the, uh, and the, um, and the Vaticanus. And then 1885, you have the revised version over there in England. So notice, 1944, he's referring 100 years back to the discovery of Sinaiticus, which was the biggest discovery. And we studied that. It, it was a what? A fraud, right? So now notice here. For the last hundred years, we have been trying to get out an edition of the Bible that is reasonably correct, but nobody wants it. What's wanted is the good old King James Version. Every jot and tittle of it. Because most people are convinced that God dictated the Bible to King James in English. Doesn't that sound like a common... Well, you, th you, think that you think that the King James parachuted down from heaven. I don't know, not, not, not exactly, not parachuted. <laughs> you, you, you think that God dictated the Bible in English. Uh, I'll say this, I don't think Paul wrote the originals in English, obviously, but I do believe that if Paul would have written in English, he would have wrote a King James Bible. When I tell you I believe that King James Bible is perfect and inspired in the very words of God, I mean to tell you I believe it. And that's exactly what he was claiming was going on in 1944 and had, been, and, and had been happening for the past hundred years. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Richard Chenevich's Trench in 1858 said this, We must never leave out of sight that for a great multitude of readers, the English version is not the translation of an inspired book, but is itself the inspired book. Notice this man, you ever heard the claim, no translation of the Bible can be inspired? You ever heard that? I've heard people say that all the time. Well, you're just, you're just reading a translation of a translation of a translation of a translation. You ever heard that before? Well, number one, that's not correct. Your King James Bible is not a translation of a translation of a translation of a translation. Your King James Bible is a translation of Greek texts a collective Greek text, the TR, because remember there was no one TR. There were thir about 13 to 15 editions of the Texas Receptus at the time of the translation of the King James Bible. And by the way, your King James Bible did not solely come from the Texas Receptus. There are different Latinisms and different things like that, different places. There are even some, uh, what do you call it, dynamic equivalencies in there and all that kind of stuff. Your King James Bible is an eclectic text. Now, Having understood that, we, do we believe, this is not a trick question, do we believe that what Paul wrote down on the original manuscripts, do we believe that is inspired? Yes. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, right? We believe that. Here's a statement, though. And this is, happens by a lot of guys that claim to be King James only, but aren't really King James only. They're, they're Greek only. Well, we believe the King James Bible is the best and the closest and the most accurate because of the, of the Greek text it came from. The problem is, is when we say that, we're not really claiming the King James Bible is inspired. We believe, we believe that the King James Bible is inspired partly because of the Greek text it came from, but also because we believe that God promised to preserve His Word. So notice... He's saying that they don't believe it's just a translation of an inspired book. They believe it's inspired itself. Uh, during that debate, uh, if you watched it, during, between Mark Ward, who will be studying his claims about the King James, between him and, and, and a guy by the name of, uh, is it Dan Halfley? Dan Halfley. Um, he said that, uh, well, you, you, and by the way, Dan Halfley was not a good representation of a King James Bible believer during that debate. But he said, uh, he said now, now, Dr. Halfley, uh, you surely don't believe the King James Bible's inspired. I mean, that's Ruckmanism. Really? Believing the King James Bible is the inspired Word of God is Ruckmanism? Well, here's, here's Richard Trench in 1858 saying that these people back then in 1858 believed that the Bible was not just a translation of an inspired book, but was itself the inspired book. Let's go to another one. Hey, here's a good one. <laughs> uh, Henry Alford, huh? Yeah, yeah, that's, 
Anyway, Henry Alfred, 1810 to 1871 is when he lived. I couldn't pinpoint, I could not pinpoint the exact date of this statement, okay? Um, the book that it came from, I, I could not pinpoint the exact date. He said the authorized, but it was no, made no later than 1871 because that's when he croaked, all right? The authorized version was, quote, the version which some would have us regard as infallible and receive as the written word of God. Amen, amen. All right, and by the way, the one I just quoted before, Trench, and that one right there, uh, uh, Alfred, Henry Alfred, those were critics of the Bible. Those were not King James Bible believers. Those were guys who were making statements about the people that they were trying to, you know, convince the Bible wasn't really the Word of God or whatever, okay? Let's continue on here. P. Marion Sims in 1936 pronounces... Unfortunately, the KJV came finally to be considered as itself divinely inspired. And the idea is not entirely gone even today. Did you see that there? He said the idea is not even gone today. This is 1936. In fact, many people who ought to be more intelligent... Did you notice that there? People who... I mean, I mean... Some of, these, some of these people just seem like such reasonable, logical people, yet they believe the King James Bible is inspired. These are these people that seem to be more intelligent, all right, who ought to be more intelligent, seem to think that the KJV is the original Bible which God handed down from heaven, all done up in English by the Lord himself. Amen. Let's continue on here. Hey, how about Charles Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers? Now, I'm, I, I like reading after Spurgeon some. I'm not a huge, huge fan of Spurgeon. Uh, he was a staunch Calvinist and different things. But, but anyway, one good thing about it, Charles Spurgeon said this. He said he, referring to John Bunyan. Now, if you remember, John Bunyan was an early Baptist. We'll look at some stuff by Bunyan here in a little bit. But Bunyan was an early Baptist. So Charles Spurgeon loved reading. Uh, uh, John Bunyan specifically loved reading um, uh, Pilgrim's Progress. In fact, he read Pilgrim's Progress like he claimed like over 180 times, something like that. But then he scoffed at somebody reading the Bible over 20 times in their lifetime. Okay, he loved, but he loved John Bunyan. He, referring to John Bunyan, had studied our authorized version, which will never be bettered, as I judge, till what? Christ shall come. That's what Charles Spurgeon said. He said that in a book on the 12 sayings on the cross. Okay, that's what he said. Here's a story, uh, John Bunyan, who we just referenced in, uh, in Spurgeon's writings. Here's a story written down in the complete works of John Bunyan, a story, a situation that happened that he recalled between him and a scholar. Boy, don't the scholars always give King James Bible believers trouble. All right? Scholar to Bunyan. So this is what the scholar said. How dare you preach, seeing you have not the original, being not a scholar? Then said Bunyan, have you the original? Yes, said the scholar. Nay, but said Mr. Bunyan, have you the very self-same original copies that were written by the penmen of the scriptures, prophets, and apostles? Here's what you have to understand. Nobody has the originals. Whenever a preacher gets up and says, will the originals say he is either lying through his teeth or completely ignorant of the issue because nobody has the originals. The originals do not exist. They're gone. They're probably disintegrated into dust. You might be breathing the particles in right now. They don't exist anymore. They're gone. All right, now notice here. So all the way back in 1680, this is when it happened, 1680, the argument, how, how many of you, well, well you, don't know, you don't know Greek, you don't know the original languages. How, how, how do you know? I mean, how, we want to get something close to, you know, the, the newer translations are closer to the original than the King James. You know, all that kind of stuff. And we've studied all that. You know the argument. But I want you to see the same arguments being made in 1680. These scholars talking about the originals and all that kind of stuff. So let's look at it. You ready? So, no, said the scholar, but we have the true copies of these originals. By the way, can I just time out right here? All these guys that want to say that the King James Bible is so hard to understand, so we need to update it into modern English so that people can better understand it, are the same people that try to say that you have to know Greek in order to know what God really says. I mean, it's just, it's a mess. All right, so, 
No, said the scholar, but we have the true copies of these originals. How do you know that, said Mr. Bunyan. How, said the scholar, why we believe what we have is a true copy of the original. Then, said Mr. Bunyan, so do I believe our English Bible is a true copy of the original. And that was said in 1680. He's, of course, referring to a King James Bible. Okay? Oh, this is a good one. William T. Brantley in 1837, he said this. He said, we shall rid ourselves of the suspicion of designing to occupy any middle ground by proclaiming in Lamine, that's a, a Latin word that I don't know what it means, uh, our sincere and unchanged attachment to the good old King, ja or excuse me, to the good old English version made by the order of King James I. It is our heart's desire and prayer to God that this venerable monument of learning, of truth, of piety, and of unequaled purity of style and diction may be perpetu uh, uh, perpetuated. Somebody pronounce that word for me. Perpetuated. perpetuated. My brain is not working right now. To the end of time, just as we now have it, let no daring genius meditate either change or amendment in its structure and composition, neither let any learned impertinence presume to disturb the happy. You see that there? William Bradley said, let's not even entertain, let's not even, let's not even be thought of as thinking that any of this text needs to be changed. Notice, that was in 1837, folks. Let's go on to one more. How far back can we get? When did King James onlyism start? Can I put forth a theory to you about when King James onlyism started? Truly, we never thought from the beginning that we should need to make a new translation, nor yet to make of a bad one a good one, but to make a good one better, or out of many good ones, What's that next phrase? One principle good one. You can read, Lawrence Vance has an incredible book called King James, His Bible and Its Translators. I have it in my office. Lawrence Vance also has another book called The uh, Translators Revisited. I, no, that's, I'm sorry, that's a different guy. Uh, I'm trying to think of the other book by Lawrence Vance. Anyway, but the book King James, His Bible and Its Translators records so many... I could have filled up an hour-long presentation of quotes by these guys. Notice, if you, if you study the translators and what their sentiments were with this translation, they started out <clears throat> to make a Bible that would be the English Bible. And it was quite obvious that that's exactly what they accomplished because for 250 years, the fringe groups were the one thinking it needed to be updated. The majority of Christendom thought it was fine the way it was. So there you have it, the King James Bible. That is in the preface from the translators to the readers right there in the, in the front. So, folks, all that to say this, this claim that the King James Bible or the King James Version only movement started in 1930 with the Seventh-day Adventists or started with Peter Ruckman is just simply false. It's untrue. It's historically wrong. And just as we've seen with all these other arguments, these people try to say, well, it's a new thing, it's a new thing, it's not even, it's not even that old, as we can see. You know, what, you know what actually is not even that old? You know what is a new thing, something that isn't old? The new, the new translations. And these Greek texts they come from, as we've shown, they're frauds. They're not, they're not old. They're neither the oldest nor the best. Your King James Bible has absolutely stood the test of time and will continue to do so, okay?